Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to day two of the Arctic Circle Forum, partnership between the Woodrow Wilson Center and uh, the Arctic Circle. Thanks to many of you, most of you, who were there, yes who was there yesterday uh, for, I don't know what that was, eight hours, 10 hours of fantastic discussion, great experts, and I wanna thank all of you who participated on the panels, who moderated, uh, who participated from the audience, but I also wanna thank many of you for holding what I thought were really great meetings out in the hallway. Uh, that's where most of, most of the work gets done and connections made. So I saw a lot of business cards uh, being exchanged and great ideas being developed. So thank you for doing that. As many of you know, I'm Mike Sfrega. I'm the director of the Polar Initiative at the Wilson Center. So uh, very proud that we now have day two of this program. It will go until a little bit before noon. We have two panels, but before the panels, I would like for you to welcome to the podium uh, the chairman of the Arctic Circle and former president of Iceland, Olafur Grimson. President Grimson. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is almost like a Baptist church. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I think uh, this, uh, this Arctic Roadshow is becoming a kind of a revival meetings uh, <laughs> in different places. <laughs> to some extent, uh, it's presumptuous of me to agree to give uh, what is uh, formally called the keynote here among uh, this very well-informed and distinguished gathering, and especially following uh, the extensive uh, and fascinating uh, discussions uh, we, had, uh, we had yesterday. I uh, <coughs> remarked to Jane uh, Harman uh, after th the meetings were over that the sessions yesterday demonstrated very clearly that the dialogue on Arctic issues is now a traditional global affairs discussion. Uh, many of you know that there has been this kind of uh, division in the foreign policy establishment of uh, Europe uh, and the United States, that on one hand there were specific uh, niche issues, <laughs> and then uh, on the other were th the more fascinating upfront global affairs, or international issues, or even uh, strategic studies. And the Arctic traditionally was considered to be a niche uh, affair. And then the more serious guys uh, talked about the global affairs and the uh, uh, security issues. But yesterday demonstrated very thoroughly that that model no longer applies. That every aspect of the traditional concerns of global affairs now applies to the Arctic dialogue. And if one doubted that conclusion, one only had to listen thoroughly to the Russian participation and how they presented uh, the Russian position within the framework of uh, Russia's relationship with the rest of the world. But also to the Arctic ambas ambassador of Korea and the representative of Singapore, especially relating how in a remarkably short time Korea has become uh, a formidable Arctic, uh, Arctic partner. I also hope, and, and I say this very clearly to the Russian participation uh, in this forum, I hope they will take back with them uh, to Moscow and the different uh, Russian regions in the Arctic. That what happened here in Washington was a deliberate, genuine, serious, and extensive attempt to bring the dialogue and the focus on Russia and the United States into the more proper, traditional, more truthful 
basis of the extraordinary positive results of the Russian-American cooperation uh, in the Arctic. When we launched this idea some months ago to have uh, an Arctic Circle Wilson Center Forum in Washington on Russia and the United States at the height of the media circus and the congressional circus and other circuses uh, around uh, in this town, uh, we were met, and I'm always honest and straightforward uh, with whomever I speak to, whether it's my American friends uh, or my Russian friends. We were met with some kind of, perhaps naturally, some kind of skepticism uh, from the representative of the Russian Federation. What in hell was our, uh, our motive? Uh, was there some kind of a plot? Uh, or were they going to be once again drawn into this circus uh, that is regularly on show in what our good friend Jane Harmon now calls the entertainment capital of the world. But I hope you have seen yesterday and will see today that on behalf of the Wilson Center and the Arctic Circle, this is a genuine, extensive, an ongoing, future-looking attempt to maintain a constructive dialogue and cooperation with, uh, with Russia. And let's not forget that when the Arctic Circle was created four years ago, it's quite remarkable, it's only four years ago since we created it, and it has in those short few years become uh, one of the uh, largest international platforms, not just on the Arctic, but on international issues. You can go all over Europe every year, and you only find in Davos in January and in Reykjavik in October uh, uh, political, business, technical, scientific assemblies of the kind that the World Economic Forum in Davos in January and the Arctic Circle in Iceland in October demonstrates. There's no such gathering anywhere in Southern Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Sweden, Finland, Norway, uh, you name it. And I think that reflects not just uh, the organizational capability of some of us who have been uh, involved in this effort, but it demonstrates the international engagement in the Arctic. But when it was founded, and I make this very clear here this morning, in addition to my own role and a few others in it, it was a joint American-Russian effort. And I hope that's not forgotten in Moscow. It was a joint American-Russian effort. Alice Rokov, Me Treadwell, Lisa Murkowski, and some others here in the United States who had been involved in Arctic issues for a long time and saw the need, uh, together with me, to, to create a new platform of a larger scale, became involved in this, and my good friend Arturo Siliganov, and also various representatives of the Russian Foreign Ministry were also involved. I traveled to Moscow in November, the year before we launched the Arctic Circle, for a dialogue with the Russian Foreign Ministry on this idea. Uh, it was a uh, low-key, very open dialogue on what were our intentions. So six months before we announced the creation of the Arctic Circle at the National Press Club here in Washington, we had these consultations in Moscow. And the reason why w we did it was that uh, we were not only optimists, but we are also realists. Uh, why I've survived in this cruel business for so long, despite my optimism. That without Russia positive engagement, there was no point in this exercise. And that joint effort is symbolized that on the honorary board of the Arctic Circle from the very beginning, Senator Lisa Murkowski and Arturo Siliganov sit side by side in the honorary board of the Arctic Circle. So to my Russian friends, 
I say this very clearly. This is your platform as well. This is not just us inviting you to come and join us. This is your platform as well, as it has been for our American friends. It's your platform. Although the Arctic Circle has the assemblies in Iceland every October and the Secretariat is based there, it's an international platform led by a constructive gathering of prominent American, Russian, and other partners in the Arctic. And in the last three or four years, being joined by uh, leading representatives of China, Korea, Japan, Singapore, France, Germany, United Kingdom, and others. President Xi Jinping of China sent a formal delegation to the Arctic Circle Assembly two years ago. Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, did the same. President Francois Hollande came and made his major speech prior to the Paris uh, climate negotiations. And I could go on long into the afternoon to list other evidences uh, of this. So as we continue from this forum here, <laughs> co-hosted by the Wilson Center. I hope we can maintain the sincerity, the constructiveness of what happened yesterday and what will happen today. And I thank uh, the Russian participants for the uh, greetings they brought from our good friend Arturo Siliganov. And please convey to him uh, when you get back to Moscow that this was a great experience. And next time when we do this, we want to see more of you. And of course, at the Arctic Circle Assembly in October in Reykjavik, we will continue this dialogue. Uh, this is a train that moves from one station to another. It's not a question of coming together, ending uh, a particular forum, um, and then go back home, and that's the end of it. No. Each stop is a part of uh, a journey. Like when uh, Alice and me uh, and Mike uh, and many others who are here attended the Arctic Territory of Dialogue conference in Arkhangelsk in March. Uh, I am the only person apart from President Putin. No, in, in fact, I am probably more than President Putin. Uh, the only person who has attended all the Arctic Territory of Dialogue conferences in Russia, either as uh, head of state or my country as a former head of state, because once when President Putin attended, he was a prime minister, not the president uh, of the Russian, <laughs> of the Russian, <laughs> Russian Federation. So uh, I had a reasonable basis to conclude in March in Arkhangel that what we witnessed there was a major scaling up on behalf of Russia on the importance of the Arctic. When I first discussed the Arctic with President Putin on my state visit to Russia in 2002, he said to me, yeah, that's true, uh, but you talk to the governors about that. Uh, it was not his portfolio. He referred me to the government, and I actually did. I traveled to Yaman Emirates and other parts of Russia in that state visit. So when we came to Arkhangelsk and saw the high-level political engagement by the Russian leadership and by all the major Russian companies and the great message that that carried for the economic future of Russia and its engagement with the rest of the world, it was like the show had moved from the small local theater up to the Grand Opera House. That was the fundamental change that had taken place. And I hope it was also noted in Moscow that two other heads of state of Arctic states attended, the president of Finland and my successor, the president of Iceland. And these are the two countries that now with Finland holding the chair of the Arctic Council and then Iceland taking over in two years' time, will precede Russia in the chairmanship of the Arctic uh, Council. But we also had three foreign ministers from Nordic NATO countries attending the Arkhangelsk uh, gathering. So I think what happened in Arkhangelsk 
And what is happening here is a very clear, realistic demonstration that not only is it possible, but it's very rewarding to facilitate this ongoing dialogue with Russia and the rest of us uh, in the Arctic. And it is important to demonstrate that because there is so much hype and so much misleading stories uh, around. But what we also saw yesterday was a multiple evidence <coughs> of how, in terms of uh, global economic progress, the transformation of the global economy, the Arctic has been has become uh, an absolutely crucial, uh, crucial territory. When the ambassador of Korea described how Korea is already building the vessels to execute the transport uh, from northern Arctic parts of Russia to both Asia and Europe, and Korea sees its role in the Russian, Arctic, Asian, European shipping as a major contribution to the Arctic future. We should also be reminded that South Korea is a key U.S. ally in Asia. And here we have one of the preeminent American allies in Asia demonstrating here in Washington not only their vision but their concrete plans in shipbuilding and transport and economic engagement with respect uh, to the Arctic. The representative of Singapore referred to the role of capital in uh, the future, economic future of the Arctic. It's kind of paradoxical that Singapore has become a leading builder together with Finland of uh, Arctic infrastructure almost a crazy notion that Singapore is taking on this role, but it's true. At the Arctic Circle Assembly in Reykjavik last year, the CEO of Kepel, the CEO of Kepel, traveled to Iceland to present in a particular session the vision and the role and the engagement of Kepel in uh, these facilities and infrastructures building uh, in the Arctic. I could go on here this morning giving you concrete examples of major enterprises and global companies from Asia now already having the Arctic as a major part of their business strategy. And these are no small players. In January, in uh, December of last year, Doug Finner, the CEO of Arctic Circle, and I attended in Shanghai a meeting with the CEO of Costco, not only the largest shipping company in China, but the largest shipping company in the world. And um, he presented the extensive Arctic strategy for Costco shipping in the 21st century. And yesterday, I was told by my good friend, the chairman of the Economic Council, that Costco had called Finland to say they now want a meeting in Finland on Arctic shipping. And why is that? The answer is what I reported at the end of the sessions yesterday, when I got on this uh, remarkable tool of communication that we have been given uh, by Apple. The monumental, I call it mega news for the Arctic, that on the 20th of June, the State Council of China announced that now the Arctic sea routes have become an integral part of the One Belt, One Road investment strategy of China for the 21st century. This was not the case when I was there in December. In my various meetings with Chinese authorities and companies as representatives, I had to urge them to talk about what I called One Belt, One Road Plus. And the plus uh, was the Arctic. And a month ago, uh, we engaged in similar discussions in China, but the end result is 
that we now have a formal document stating the official policy of President Xi Jinping on China that the evolution of the Arctic Sea Route had become an integral part of the One Road, One Belt, and thereby of the investment structure that the new Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, as well as the One Belt, One Road Investment Fund, will devote their formidable investment resources to in the coming years. So no wonder Costco called Helsinki yesterday and said, let's have a meeting. I hope the Finns remember to invite some of us also uh, to that meeting. Absolutely. But my friends, this is no small item. Because the One Belt, One Road is the most extensive policy around for the complete transformation of the global transport and economic system linking Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Americas now through the Arctic Sea Route in a completely new way. And to have that formal announcement backed up, which is also a part of the report which I read last night, extensive paragraphs of what this involves for the engagement of China in Arctic investment, Arctic infrastructure, Arctic renewable energy uh, buildup, uh, Arctic dialogue, as well as the involvement in what they call the uh, prominent international Arctic-related forums, is for all of us yet another indication, in addition to the presentation by the ambassador of Korea and the representative of Singapore yesterday, that we have now entered a completely new world. And we better scale up in order to be able to deal with that uh, challenge that the combined effort of uh, China and other Asian partners, as well as the leading European economies, will have uh, on the Arctic. And that is why this cooperation between the Wilson Center and the Arctic Circle is so important. We all know that in the Arctic Council, the uh, observer states are not allowed to speak. Uh, as was highlighted by my good friend, uh, the late Michel Rocard, former Prime Minister of France, who was appointed by Sarkozy as the representative of the President of France to the Arctic and then reappointed by President Hollande and had attended n numerous meetings of uh, ministerial meetings of the Arctic Council and all the meetings of the Arctic Council, but never been allowed to speak. And he complained memorably in Paris three years ago with a sentence I will never forget, but which highlights uh, uh, this uh, problem. France is not accustomed not to be allowed to speak. <laughs> <laughs> so they need other platforms to speak, to maintain this dialogue. And that is why the Arctic Circle has served formal delegations from China, Japan, Korea, France, Germany, Britain, and now in October, in addition, also India and Poland, as well uh, uh, as others. And now after the United States has handed over a successful chairmanship of the Arctic Council, it's important that here in Washington we have a platform, an institution, and uh, an engine room, I will call it, to maintain this dialogue on behalf of this crowd in this town, whether it's the policy institutes, uh, the departments, the House, the Senate, uh, or others. And that is why I hope that this cooperation between us in the Arctic Circle and the Wilson Center will continue. And I am absolutely convinced that it actually will. And we are prepared on our part in the Arctic Circle to continue that cooperation by hosting regularly here in Washington in cooperation with the Wilson Center similar forums. Perhaps not uh, on just Russia and the United States, but other aspects. But also allowing the uh, observer states like China, Korea, Japan, and others, as well as the European countries, to come to Washington, invited by us, and have a dialogue with the leading policymakers and the political and economic leadership of this country through this facility. And that's why it's so important that in the Chinese <laughs> statement, they phrase it in the way they do. 
in uh, Arctic-related international fora. Because on their part, that is their invitation to us to also facilitate uh, that uh, dialogue. So all of this, of course, in addition to the fascinating description of the scientific cooperation we listened to yesterday, which, by the way, reminds all of us that the Russian and U.S. cooperation in the Arctic is deeply rooted in the scientific cooperation, as well as the human dialogue between the people in Alaska, Chukotka, uh, and other parts uh, of Russia. And therefore, as a conclusion here this morning, I want to thank the Wilson Center again for having entered this so constructively in such a formidable way. And I hope this uh, will be a beginning of a very constructive cooperation involving all the other Arctic players. And I also finally say to my Russian friends, bring back to Moscow the constructive report of how successful this exercise has been. And there is no risk for Russia to continue in this dialogue, either in October in Reykjavik, as I know Russia will. We've already invited the governor of Murmansk and various other representatives of Russia to attend, but also here in Washington, in what our good friend Jane Harman has called the entertainment capital of the world, <laughs> but also is the power center of the global uh, community. So thank you very much. And I just want to introduce this programming to say a word that almost doesn't need to be said, but for all of you in the audience who haven't had a chance to get to know the man who just finished speaking, there are just a few things I would say. One is you should know I call him my very own idea of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Any of you old enough to remember Jimmy Stewart in that movie? Well, here he is. Unfortunately, he was born in the wrong country. But you can see that he embodies exactly what we need at this moment on this subject. And on behalf of Planet Jane Harmon, as we call her now, I want you all to know that President Grimson has kindly advised to be on the advisory board of the Polar Initiative at the Wilson Center, in a sense formally joining our two efforts. And that may be the most valuable gift you give us in this country. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Grimson. Thank you, Alice Rogoff. Uh, it's quite uh, comforting to have President Grimson, Alice Rogoff, me, Treadwell, Tero Goresti, and others on the Polar Initiative Board, uh, not just to provide for us uh, insight, but also to think about the vision uh, for the Arctic. So I thank you very much. As President Grimson pointed out, uh, this is now an enduring relationship between the Arctic Circle and the Wilson Center. We look forward to hosting yet another forum like this, perhaps on some different topics, some of which he covered uh, in the future, perhaps next year at the same time. We'll let you know. But this is not a one-program pony. This is something that must continue in this town, and we'll make sure that the Arctic Circle, the Wilson Center, and our other partners in this town together keep addressing the important issues of the Arctic so President Grimson, thank you. Alice, thank you. I do want to, before we get to the panels, Terrell, I do want to just once again thank those who have supported us on so many levels. Ikbyokfuk uh, Nuket uh, Corporation, GCI, the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, and the North Star Group. Without um, our friends, this simply wouldn't happen. So UIC, uh, I see many of my friends back there from UIC. Thank you so very much for not just supporting us financially, but for what the enrichment on our program and informing the dialogue yesterday. Thank you so very much. Uh, to GCI, again, not just for the corporate support, but for the insight uh, and the content in which you brought to the, to the day. Thank you very much. The U.S. Arctic Research Commission, John Farrell, organizing two programs that I think highlight and underscore what President Grimson said. The tradition of cooperation between the United States and Russia is deeply rooted and, in fact, is a part of our future. And in science and research, it's palpable. We see it. And to our friends at the North Star Group, helping us to craft the proceedings 
of this program yesterday and today, which we will put out for public release once we have uh, run that by, reviewed, and discussed it with our Russian colleagues who were here yesterday. So thank you very much for that. Uh, with that, Terrell, I would like to introduce you, Terrell Voreste, the chairman of the uh, Arctic Economic Council, also Artia Limited, and he will introduce this panel coming up. We'll take a coffee break at about 10, 15, 10, 20, and then we'll head to the second council. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, quite okay, quite okay. Hallelujah, Arctic. <laughs> So it gives me great pleasure to uh, start with the first panel of today and, and, and start by thanking, first of all, with all your leadership, Mr. President. Since you revealed uh, the discussion which we had with Chinese yesterday, may I reveal something from the Arctic infrastructure in Iceland as well? Okay, with your, with your pro. Um, we had a great discussion uh, three years ago in Iceland when I was... Uh, uh, honored to be participating uh, the state visit of our president uh, to, to you, Mr. President, at your very beautiful house. And uh, we had the new government, which had just taken over the day before that particular day. And I just love this Icelandic blink in the eye, which you have and which, which all your colleagues have. And that blink in the eye was in the eyes of the new young enthusiastic ministers. And we were introducing ourselves to each other, and uh, and uh, we had two young Icelandic ministers over there, and the first one was telling me, well, let me introduce to my colleague, uh, uh, she's this and that, she's responsible for the traffic and infrastructure. Oh, no, that's you! <laughs> <laughs> so that was a great start. But uh, let's go uh, to uh, the panel of today, and I would like to uh, invite uh, to the podium uh, uh, Price Bauer, uh, Roger Mark de Souza, Christina Woolston, and Robert Sheldon, please uh, welcome the team to the uh, podium. So, with me this morning here, uh, uh, I have uh, Price Bauer. Price is the chairman of the board of directors from uh, UIC, and uh, uh, he, she's been, he's been working on that uh, uh, since uh, 2012, and uh, respectively been serving as the vice chairman since 2011. Um, Alaska, which is the northernmost point in America, and your Alaska Native Co Corporation, UIC, provides social and economic resources to over 2,900 Inupiat shareholders and their descendants. So welcome, Mr. Bauer. Uh, thank you, and Parlanti. Good morning and welcome, everybody. And I'm thankful to be up here today. It was uh, not by George, but I'm here, and uh, I'm ta talking about our, the environmental and social life for, which kind of for our, our native people in Barrow. So like what we have, what we were done by our ancestors and our ancestors before us, we are the stewards of our environment up in the North, north Slope, and uh, so we have to work with what we got and, and take only too much, so. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll introduce the whole panel, and uh, I'll give some introductory remarks, and then you will get the uh, remarks with about five to ten minutes. Uh, Christina Woolston. Christina is uh, the Vice President for External Relations with Quintilion. And Quintilion is uh, uh, a remarkable Arctic player uh, with uh, renewing and providing new connections in the future. And uh, we had a, an opportunity to discuss with you a couple of weeks ago in Fairbanks in terms of uh, potential future collaboration and, uh, and also with your colleagues in Oulu, Oulu last week. And, uh, Quintilion uh, plays a significant role in uh, speeding up the connections, uh, not only in the Arctic, but also throughout the world. So welcome, Christina. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Roger Marc de Souza. Uh, you're the Director of Population, Environmental Security and Resilience at the Wilson Center. 
so uh, you have a vast experience of uh, different sorts of er areas uh, in terms of, of the Arctic and uh, I'm sure today we're going to hear your views about social issues and, and population issues within the Arctic. So welcome, Roger Mark. <laughs> and finally, uh, Mr. Robert Sheldon. Welcome. Uh, Robert uh, beholds a company which uh, uh, does investments in the Arctic and uh, perhaps some investments in the icebreakers in the future as well. We discussed this over the coffee this morning, so we'll see about that. But you have a vast experience of uh, potential of uh, uh, investments in the future for icebreaking as well. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. So let me start uh, uh, this discussion by uh, giving you a brief description about the Arctic Economic Council and what that is all about. So uh, the Arctic Economic Council is uh, a baby of the Arctic Council and it was established uh, when uh, Canada was chairing uh, the Arctic Council. And this actually was also a Russia-US effort since uh, the uh, uh, co-chairs uh, of the working group which was uh, doing the preparationary work within the Arctic Council came from both of these countries and from Iceland and, and from Finland as well. So um, it was considered a couple of years ago that uh, there is not enough uh, links between the Arctic Council and the business uh, uh, people. So it was considered that we have politicians talking here and we have business people talking here and the community people talking here and there is no link into the dialogue. Yet again, most of the infrastructural work, investments, uh, other jobs which are done in the Arctic are in the end provided by private companies. So it was considered that uh, some sort of a tool for a dialogue between the Arctic Council and the business community is required. So this task force uh, worked for a year and gave its recommendation of uh, starting uh, an Arctic Economic Council. And it uh, gave uh, the ideas uh, how the construction of the Arctic Economic Council should be done taking into account all the Arctic areas, uh, meaning the eight Arctic states, and also the indigenous peoples observer organizations. And now we're a team of uh, more than 42 people uh, working throughout the Arctic, uh, coming from more than 40 companies, and also inviting the whole international business community into our work. Since we have now been working for three years we have uh, secured our funding, we have secured our organization, and we have established a strategy. There are certain overarching themes uh, which uh, give us uh, the long-term guideline of our work. So what we don't want to see, what we have seen, at least to some extent in the work of the Arctic Council, that you have a chair period which is of two years, and then things sort of change when the new chair country comes in. So we don't want to work like that. So that's why we have overarching themes and a strategy. And for the overarching themes, I would like to highlight uh, some important issues, whereas uh, market access is from one Arctic area to another, and also linking the international value chains of business are of utmost importance. So we're a bit worried about the current developments of the sanctions, worried about the uh, barriers of protectionism uh, which uh, have been arising throughout the past one or two years. The market entries may be somewhat more difficult than where they were a couple of years ago. And this worries us because uh, it's a fact that we need the best available services and best available products to be exported and imported from one Arctic area to another. Of high importance is also the small and medium enterprises of, uh, of uh, indigenous peoples because they provide us the know-how, they, pro they provide us the future, and we're working on that land. So the future big enterprises are the small and medium enterprises of the day. So that's why we try to act as a voice and tone of the small and medium enterprises and, and, uh, and of the indigenous peoples as well. Human resources capital, that is of high importance and that is one of the flavors of uh, the Finnish chair period for the Arctic Economic Council. So um, we've seen situations that uh, the unemployment uh, in the Arctic area 
is much higher than within the other areas of the specific ar Arctic countries. This is the case in actually most of the Arctic countries. So yet there are situations that you have to bring in people to work from the so-called southern areas to work in the Arctic areas and simultaneously there is a high level of Im Im unemployment. So that's why the know-how of the people and education is, is for, for high importance for us. We already discussed yesterday about the rules and regulations. Uh, we need to see as united rules and regulations as possible within the Arctic. We don't want to see situations that unexpected rule changes uh, force a company to get back from its, from its uh, uh, operations. And yet again, situations where in one area you had to have these sorts of rules and another area you had to have that sort of rules is of much complication to a company which would like to operate in the Arctic areas. Interconnected Arctic, that's one of the important areas and that's actually one of the areas for the chairmanship period of the Arctic Council for my country, Finland, as well. We will hear about the interconnected Arctic today from uh, uh, our, our colleagues uh, who, who work on this area. And we discussed yesterday al already about the, the need of uh, cables uh, going through the polar area, through the Northern Sea Route to the North West Passage area. So these are some of the areas uh, which uh, are of high importance for the work of the Arctic Economic Council. We welcome all businesses to participate. And our first two or three years uh, in the United States have been somewhat Alaska concentrated, I would, I would have to say. So we really love to see the lower 48 to enter into the business and, uh, and, and provide insights as well as provide investments because uh, within the Arctic, there's this investment potential of $1 trillion. And within the Arctic, such assets are difficult to find. We can't find one trillion dollars out of the taxpayers of uh, the Arctic people, which is only four million people. So we need public-private partnerships. So with this, I would like to uh, turn to my panel and uh, start with Price and your views about the uh, indigenous businesses. And uh, welcome, and the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Dar. And uh, like I said, Paul Leipzig, good morning. And um, uh, I'm talking about our environmental up in the our area, and uh, we have to, we were taught by our ancestors and the ancestors before us that we need to take care of our environment and just uh, take what we need and then uh, make sure that there's some stuff left behind for our future generation. So we are, are the stewards of our environment up in the North Slope, and like I say, we have to take care of it and then. Uh, we take what we need and then um, and then we have to uh, make sure that everything is done properly and then for the f for the future like the we're dealing with the oil companies and we got them uh, guidelines that uh, UIT had put together after talking with our community leaders and our, our a, like our Eskimo Oiling Commission that we work with that are out there protecting our sea, making sure that we continue our whaling. And uh, they made some guidelines on how to work with the oil, oil industry. And uh, UIT was one of the big uh, put a put input on that. They made the night uh, guidelines for the oil, com oil companies to follow. So. So there's some policies in place that we have uh, already set in when Shell Oil was up there. So, but like I say, we have to take care of our environment, make sure everything is uh, put back to the natural states when we're done, and take what we need. So, and then on the social life, we at the uh, ingenious people, we take care of our people. And then we share w what we got with our elders and and people that don't have any hunters to provide food for them. We provide food for them, make sure that nobody's starving. And then um, our people are so close together that we work and we got a real good social life up there. Like uh, 
we built our our own hospitals for our people to uh, go to if they're sick or something because uh, nobody else is do doing it to help us out so at the the in being indigenous people we take care of our people and make sure that nobody's left behind and then and uh, we have to teach our young folks young people to follow through what we were taught and then pass it on to the next generation so with that I'll uh, put an answer in let let them speak so well thank you very much just a quick follow-up question so uh within the indigenous communities and the indigenous people and peoples uh there are actually varied views for for instance uh, natural resources extraction uh, there are some uh, views which are mainly going into the traditional livelihoods and uh, just for the environmental protection. Yet again, there are others who are saying that uh, we have been adapting to the change of life for centuries and we need to adapt now and do this so-called modern investment. So we'd love to hear your view on this. Okay, yeah, we uh, we got we had a lot of opposition when we first started dealing with uh, our young people we were taught when we were growing up we our first language was Inupia so we did not speak English so that was our secondary language that we had to learn in when we went to school if we were talking in our native language we'd be reprimanded or whatever but now with the younger people it's reversed and now everybody speaks English and then you got te uh, teach them how to speak Inupiaq, and then and a lot of young people are more into the Western lifestyle now, so everybody just getting so spoiled to have everything right there. And and then like when we were growing up, we had to w work to get what we want. And then now, uh, with the uh, well, well, shall I hopefully the oil companies are going to be coming back up n North Slope. I know we got the Calais, uh oil field and then the Alpine and then TD10 that uh, over by Dead Horse that are hopefully be pr providing job for our younger generations. And we got a lot of young people that are getting more educated and taking more, getting more into the uh, oil, oil field services uh, degree and a lot of young people going to college to get what they need to survive but when we were growing up we had to do with what we had so mm -hmm. okay well thank you very much so we'll turn over to Christina uh, you're about to lay some cables uh, is that the case so what's gonna be uh, the result there's no the about to we have been that's right um, I have a couple of brief slides to just show some of Go the ahead. construction is that all right yes um, do you have the clicker are you gonna run it or shall I That'd be great, thank you. Thank you so much, Taro, and of course the Arctic Council um, and the Wilson Center. So Quintillion is a um, company headquartered in Anchorage, Alaska. We are privately funded and are currently in the process of building our um, Quintillion subsea cable system. I was told that some brief slides and some pictures of what we are doing would not be unwelcomed, and that is because there is a dynamic conversation about the dynamic advancement of the Arctic, and many of the conversations are around what can we do, what should we do, what will we do, and Quintillion is here to talk about the project that we are currently constructing, and we are about complete with phase one. The system is designed to, and is planned to connect Europe to Asia. Those are natural marketplaces. Um, there is a lack of diversity in terms of connecting those two major marketplaces and major continents. The Arctic has yet to be um, advanced in terms of telecommunications from a fiber route. And we took advantage of the opportunity as environmental changes and, and um, climates are adjusting, there is an opportunity with a more 
with fewer, excuse me, with fewer days where there's ice and more open water in order to construct the cable. So we started in Alaska with phase one. It's nearly complete. We're in service with the terrestrial system in Alaska along the Dalton Highway as of April of this year. Last summer, we nearly completed all of phase one Alaska, and this is a more... Um, close-up view of that system. We have a small portion of work yet to be installed this summer. Um, each community, each section of the project is um, based upon a, a unique risk profile and it's important for us to accomplish and to achieve the desired burial and installation of this cable for the long-term resiliency and protection of the system. The system, as I mentioned, is anchored in Alaska, and we believe that to be the most challenging portion of the build. We have vessels currently in the water heading to Alaska to complete the last segment just off of Prudhoe Bay there to the main, brand, uh, to the main trunk line. Um, and this is the beginning of a much larger system. Phase two is planned to head west from the Nome branching unit to Asia. That is in development right now. Phase 3A will eventually and is planned to head east from Prudhoe Bay into northern Canada with planned um, branching lines into northern Canadian communities, and then eventually 3B on to Europe. This will provide a diverse route. It will provide multiple points of interconnectedness out of North America, out of the United States, through Alaska, and the opportunity for a shorter route between Europe and Asia and those marketplaces. While the population is often sparse and dispersed, the market has shown itself to be ready for private investment. Quintillion is a privately funded company, and we are proof, we believe, that private investment can be made in the Arctic despite some of the challenges. But the opportunities are many, and we believe the time is now for additional infrastructure investment to be made. The installation is challenging. And the environment can often be unwelcoming, but with proper planning and with a considerable amount of um, courage and a desire to get things done, we have been and we will continue to work in um, an environment that is both challenging but also provides many opportunities. There is a lack of um, basic equipment to install in the Arctic. Um, there are continuing to be more resources deployed in terms of the um, basic tools to install in the Arctic. And we have been um, excited about the success that we've seen so far in terms of the installation. Um, but it is certainly a challenge and one that we are excited to be making. These are some of the pieces of equipment, and this is off coast of Barrow last summer, Ukiavik, pardon me, um, last summer as we installed our cable. The cable is designed to be buried along the cable route, and, oh, pardon me, and that's to avoid the risk of a number of different factors. As I mentioned, each community, each landing point, all points along the route have its own unique risk profile. I see Gail Schubert in the audience here, the CEO, President and CEO of Bering Straits Native Corporation. Of course, the community of Ukiavik and others have its own risk profile. And we have a design plan to bury the cable in order to avoid those risks and to protect the cable long term. It is important to adjust to the environment in which you are building and it is a unique environment um, but we're excited about what the future holds and the opportunities that our system will bring. The distance can be a challenge. This is a photo of a repeater so equipment can help us overcome some of the distance and some of the challenges with latency. The communities are ready for broadband. The communities are ready for interconnectedness from what we have seen, and we are pleased to be here today to represent private industry working in the Arctic as members and Alaskans um, of an Arctic community um, to be participating in the investment of infrastructure for a sustainable Arctic. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a cable from uh, London to Tokyo going through the Arctic and uh, going also via Alaska. So for a consumer, what does this mean? 
for a consumer in, in a variety of markets, it means a number of things. Um, I'll start with Alaska. We were speaking with an individual in Wainwright, one of the communities in which we're deploying fiber. Um, he had attempted to download uh, Windows Anniversary Edition, and it took him 36 hours. It is a challenge to be a part of a global marketplace. The interconnectedness in which we are presently engaged in but lack some of the basic tools in order to make that happen. Um, our, this is an opportunity for us to, um, to truly participate in a global marketplace. The distance between Europe and Asia as two major markets is a considerable opportunity. Um, developing through the Arctic into northern Canadian communities that um, participate in telecommunications or serve through telecommunications primarily through satellite or microwave. And while we need all of the tools of telecommunications in order to connect our communities, we need backup, we need diversity, we need redundancy, and all of those things are important. This is the piece, the fiber that we are laying um, can provide many of the tools to advance telecommunications. For example, fiber, because of the lack of operations and maintenance costs long term, can be, and we have already seen this happening in the Alaska market, can be offered at wholesale prices at 50 to 90 percent cheaper than satellite and microwave backhaul prices. Um, Quintillion is a wholesale provider, I should have mentioned that earlier. We are building the infrastructure and we are enabling competition within communities that in many cases, over 120,000 Alaskans, have a single provider of telecommunications. You see advancement and you see innovation when you are competing and when you are when you are working for people's products price and services and so this is an exciting opportunity uh, you don't have to reveal any uh, confidential business issues but wha what's the logic of uh, the e economies and and the, so who are your customers and what about the investors and so how does this all work? The the communities in which we were initially building into Alaska and, and of course the, the long term goal between the two marketplaces is uh, I think fairly understood. In rural communities I think it is a miscalculation that the market is not ready to serve itself from a private investment standpoint. The current telecommunications model is high margins and low volume. The capacity is limited when you're working with satellite and microwave with larger with populations. By having a fiber backhaul you can change the you can change the calculation and, and the um, the formula to be a high volume low margin um, situation and so we feel and we have seen that the market is ready in demanding broadband true broadband and the universal excuse me the federal communications um, department quantifies that at 25 megabits per second download um, at a minimum and these are not minimums that we're achieving in our communities and so that is the piece there is truly the market is ready and private investment um, takes a very strong look at that we need to both answer the technical feasibility as well as the financial feasibility in every portion of our build, and they all stand alone. Okay, over to you, Roger Mark. So uh, it's the Arctic population who is going to be using this telecommunications infrastructure, uh, I hope, quite soon. And uh, we'd love to hear your views on environmental security issues and, uh, and the population issues. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Taro. So I, I think coming out of our discussion yesterday, there were three themes that, that came to the fore uh, for me, which I think um, Senator also emphasized in her opening remarks. And those were around consensus, commonality, and cooperation. And I think as we think of our discussion today, I sort of go back to those themes. And I think some of the opening remarks that we've had from President Grimson about moving from the local theater to the Grand Opera House. And I think we have to be careful as we move from the local theater to the Grand Opera House that we don't lose a sense of what's happening in the day-to-day -day lives of, of, of the communities and people in the Arctic. So in, in the work that we do here at the Wilson Center on building resilience, it is very much focused on looking at some of the issues that Christina just mentioned. I was, I was quite pleased to hear Christina say a number of times the risk 
profile, developing resiliency in a system. So you have this from an, a corporate operational point of view. How do you transfer these concepts and these approaches um, to build on the points that Price has made with regard to engaging people, communities, um, inclusivity, and intergenerational responsibility? So that's what we try to have a sense of how this is happening globally and what it means to the Arctic. So in terms of looking at risks in the Arctic from an environmental point of view, the, the um, intergovernmental panel um, on climate change has identified three potential large-scale singular events or tipping points for, for the Arctic. The first is looking as, um, at as light reflecting ice decreases that an increasing amount of solar radiation is absorbed by the surface, accelerating, melting, and warming. So having a sense of what that means. Looking, um, number two, at major shrinking of the Greenland ice sheets that could um, significantly exacerbate global sea level rise. And third, looking at thawing permafrost and what that means in terms of the release of methane, which is, um, is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So in looking at this internationally, there's a recognition that modeling these thresholds is difficult and that there's a high level of uncertainty with regard to the projections. But it is part of the risk profile and trying to have a sense of what this means for business operations and for community engagement. Part of what we also focus here on at the Wilson Center is looking at what we call back draft impacts. So as we look at these risk profiles and put into place very good programs that address these risks are then knock on unanticipated impacts that we, we don't um, plan for, such as issues around conflict um, arising from these environmental threats and what this means for areas um, in, in Alaska and, and beyond in the Arctic. So there are certain key principles that we have are seeing used internationally, and I think Bryce has been talking about some of them as we engage local populations and communities. So the first is around non-discrimination, equity, and, and equality, recognizing the importance of including um, these communities in um, the participatory processes that are involved in developing and um, taking action on these risk profiles. The question of self-determination, the importance of indigenous peoples being able to look at the right to self-governance, autonomy in matters that relate to their local and internal and local affairs, free, prior, and informed consent. What does that mean with regard to effective participation, building on the institutions that already exist within these communities, their mechanisms for representation, for decision-taking processes, and for conflict resolution. And then finally, recognizing that there's a rights-based perspective, a right and access to land, but what does this mean for development um, that is cognizant of their culture and identity? And what, how does this tie to the eco-economics of recognizing the value of preserving the cultural and ecological landscapes that we know coming out of, of these communities? So as we think of economic um, development in the region. These are some of the principles that we're looking to act upon and think about what it means for community engagement, indigenous populations, and uh, the day-to-day -day lives of, of uh, people in the Arctic. In, in terms of uh, uh, identity, so um, if we consider the indigenous communities, they're going through a major transformation uh, from traditional livelihoods to, to modern societies. Some are faster, some are slower, and it depends on, on, on the area. But wha what's your view ab about that outcome, and how do you see the societal problems uh, linked to that? 
I think it's an excellent question. I think it, it, it raises some of the questions that I think Price has also mentioned in terms of intergenerational responsibility. Um, part of this is a, um, a, a willingness and a, a desire to maintain traditional identity and cultures, but also move to modernism and having access to the type of resources that, that Christina uh, talks about. There's also an element of um, sort of the, the well-established elders in the community wanting to preserve these customs and then younger the younger populations wanting to advance so I think more and more globally we are seeing the importance of valuing traditional knowledge and practices and the degree to which that helps build resilience within uh, local communities and the importance of transferring that information and valuing that information um, to the younger uh, parts of the communities in in a way that they recognize that there's real economic value in looking at these tradition bases of traditional knowledge and how that helps preserve the communities. So there's a push to modernism. We want to, to encourage that, but we also want to recognize and be respectful of the traditional knowledge and base that has served as a means of resiliency over time. And there's an international movement to recognize and build on that that has been actually worked in to a lot of the international kind change um, agreements. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Robert, yesterday we heard that uh, there is a one trillion investment potential and Mark Ein said that don't worry there are trillions. How much do you have? <laughs> 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 nice to meet you as well. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, <laughs> yeah, if I may just just for a moment it's quite an honor to be here at the Wilson Center. It's great to see our friends again from the Ar Arctic Circle Assembly. Uh, and all of you for taking time out of your day to uh, join us. Um, it's also quite a pleasure to not only be on this panel along uh, uh, with all of us, but there's three Alaskans on this panel. I'm the third. Um, I'm a newcomer, though. My descent is from Scandinavia 400 years ago, so uh, the other two members have been in Alaska quite a, quite a bit for longer. Um, my family gained its start uh, after hitting the east coast of North America, we kept going west until we hit the next ocean and then went north. Uh, we have a bit of a wanderlust about us. Uh, we pioneered most of the air routes in South America as well as quite a bit in Alaska as well. And because of that, logistics and expertise with fuel movements and those sorts of things uh, is part of our family businesses. We've owned hotels, uh, grocery, uh, all of these sorts of things. And so <laughs> uh, when it comes to investment uh, at the high latitudes, uh, which I operate not only in Alaska, but Canada, Iceland, Greenland, and parts of mainland Scandinavia. Uh, it it, it be has become very apparent to me that we have one overriding factor that we really have to pay attention to. Um, the Arctic is an extraordinarily complex economic system. It may not look like that to you as viewers. Uh, however, what the best way to describe it that I've found over time is we're an emerging economy settled with a mature bureaucracy. That's a problem. In the Arctic, we have very few people, lots of resources. Bureaucracies love lots of people, lots of layers. So automatically, straight out of the chute, we have this, this complication of, of this mature bureaucracy overlay. And so when we have a normal economy where we have resource extraction, and it's important to note that that's not just fish or, or growing things on the ground or mining, but it's also view extraction too. Tourism came up yesterday, and I think that's part of the re resource extraction sector of the economy. But the other three are value add, service and support, as well as research and development. Um, when you have this overlay, though, of a mature bureaucracy, that can be very, very difficult to navigate. As President Grimson mentioned yesterday, uh, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank uh, has moved forward in a number of ways, uh, actually also welcoming not just the Scandinavian states but Canada as well, which is quite exciting to see that perhaps we'll have some better communication along those ways. But of course, those folks together with the Silk Road Fund have been very active with our friends in Russia as well. Uh, whether it's at Yamal or some of the other potential rail and other opportunities that are emerging very rapidly, uh, we finally see a financing mechanism that involves more than just one country or one area. We have something similar happening here in North America. The Canadian government has just launched a large infrastructure fund. You probably don't know about it, but it has 400 employees already. Um, 
so when we have these sorts of mechanisms together with back in Europe, <laughs> European Investment Bank uh, efforts uh, such as uh, EKF, which is a Danish export credit fund, uh, we can knit together other ways to finance things. It's kind of snuck up on us all, though. Uh, while we've all been toiling away and worrying about uh, connectivity and, and how to get things put together um, over the last five years, it's really all of these items I just mentioned happened in the last 18 months. It's uh, rather exciting to watch it uh, move along because it allows new cross and transnational investment. So the lifeblood of all economies is finance. And now that we have these other tools in place, I think it's a very uh, uh, good opportunity to, to finally advance, perhaps normalize relations more, uh, uh, again, with transnational investment. Uh, but uh, the, the long story short is, is that there's a lot that's, that, that has happened in the last 18 months, and I, I can't wait to get moving on this, perhaps even with ships. <laughs> OK, uh, so um, in, in terms of connectivity, um, there are visions and dreams, and one of the visions is a tunnel between the Russia and the United States. So would you be interested in investing into that? <laughs> uh, far, more <laughs> in, far more interesting is this Belt and Road Initiative that the, the Chinese have, have put together, and it's been around for quite some time. Um, in their sphere of reference, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It actually makes up more than half the world's GDP. People should pay attention to it. Um, they, they, together with, with those sorts of efforts, uh, uh, can engage in that. Of course, uh, any tunnel uh, to, to Russia or, or any other type of bringing the rail to the coast and then maybe having some sort of a ferrying system, more ships, you might like that better. Um, the, that that seems a, a a bit more profound and likely than that than a, a tunnel at this point in time. We don't have the infrastructure on the Alaska side. The rail does not uh, extend up. However, there is a group. Uh, uh, the last person to build a ma major rail line in Canada, John Falsetta, has proposed uh, another link. Mead Treadwell is involved with that, uh, along with John. Uh, Mead was on uh, uh, or up here yesterday. Uh, but so the long story short there is is that uh, tunnel no, but other ways yes. Okay, well investing into ships is that's that's good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> or even icebreakers perhaps. Okay. Um, before we open uh, uh, the uh, floor for the audience, uh, some follow-up questions. Uh, Christina, one of the overarching themes of the Arctic Economic Council is uh, is uh, connections, connectivity, and and interconnected Arctic. So. Uh, we heard your views about the, uh, the, the business your company is uh, going to provide, but uh, how do you see uh, the connectivity in the Arctic in, in broader terms, and what are your views of, of, of that, both in terms of the investment, but also for the people of the Arctic? Mm -hmm. Well, as Rog Robert mentioned, there are three of us that are um, from Alaska and participate in an economy and a, and a social structure that is based in the Arctic. And when we look at an interconnected Arctic, and I was pleased, um, Taro, to be part of the um, Telecommunications Broadband Task Force with the Arctic Economic Council, um, and hopefully that will continue to be a priority. And, and I encourage um, those in the audience to go to the AEC website, Arctic Economic Council website, and you can pull up some of these um, work products that are profound. And I think um, one of the pieces of that are the participatory nations within the Arctic Economic Council and the Arctic Council and their views for telecommunications and interconnectedness. There is a lot happening, and there is a lot that um, nations have committed to doing, which I think is exciting. Um, recently in Aulu, there were a number of presentations about potential plans, and and I think one of the pieces that is fascinating to me, um, Mr. Yamamoto from Hokkaido University presented a slide about where the data centers are in the world, and there are very few in the northern climes, and there are many um, industries that are looking for greener pastures, so to speak, in terms of where they store their data and where are the next opportunities. Without interconnectedness between in the Arctic, um, we would not have the opportunity to be a part of that economic um, potential. 
And that creates opportunities on the ground for our communities to participate in the global marketplace and to develop new economic opportunities. Um, the, the priority to maintain our communities and our sense of place and our sense of self in our native communities um, is important. I think the, as, as Price had mentioned, We've, we've adjusted over time. My family is Athabascan and, and from um, southwest Alaska, and we've been a part of the changes over the decades and millennia, and, and we've, uh, we've adjusted to the changes, and we will continue to. And connectedness is, is a priority for many communities, and we think that there's great potential to preserve and to protect and to advance and to bring back many of our cultural tenants that have not been preserved and promoted for some time. Okay. Price, um, the education uh, is uh, of high importance, and that's something you mentioned uh, as, as, as uh, an important area, and it's, again, one of the overarching themes of the Arctic Economic Council. Now we hear that uh, Christine and the colleagues are providing uh, improved uh, connectivity in the future, so how do you see... Uh, learning uh, by connectivity with uh, tablets and computers and perhaps uh, via Skype uh, when it's uh, very difficult to organize classroom if you have, you know, three or four young kids only in the community. So how do you see this opportunity? Well, our school, school district up in the North Low Borough, they have the, the teleconference type communication that they can do with all the eight villages that we work up there and then our college up there does the same thing so they can talk with the UAA, UAF uh, and uh, see what courses they can take or what the students can take but to make sure that they get the right education and um, do the telecommunication and being with the quintillion coming on I think it's it's going to be a lot faster and a lot better connect connectivity to all the villages. But right now we sometimes when the power is cut off in like in Anchorage or Palmer, it affects our uh, internet system up there. And then with the so the sunspot that we get, it uh, really affects it too. So I think with the Quintelon coming on, it's going to make some big improvements, and uh, hopefully our colleges and the school district will. Uh, improve w with that too. Okay, very good. We're going into uh, the societal implications of an investment. So uh, how do you see uh, the connectivity from uh, the sociological point of view? No, I'm, I'm really glad to hear the discussion that we are, we are having. Um, last November, we um, at the Wilson Center co-facilitated a meeting that was held at the University of Hawaii together with the White House, looking at um, representatives from Alaska, from Louisiana, and from the South Pacific. And we were looking specifically at how communities were dealing with questions on connectivity, dealing with climate risks and their plans for relocation. So many of these communities are trying to think about, okay, how do they adapt to these risks? How do they see um, climate having an impact on their lives right now and what it means for community mobilization, understanding, um, um, thinking of adaptation in place, and then thinking about what they can do before they need to relocate. And if they need to relocate, how do they plan, um, um, uh, operationalize the re relocation, and determine the cost of relocating? And this question of connectivity kept coming up. It was really important as a tool to understand uh, some of the impacts and to think about how they could plan for that, but how they could learn from the examples um, from communities in Louisiana, uh, communities in small island states in the Pacific. So there's a real urgency as these communities are on the front lines of determining how they deal with them, this, these impacts, to be able to connect um, not only among themselves 
themselves, but to other communities and to learn from. So I think this is it's a huge opportunity. It's, it's cutting edge right now, and it really is um, very important to be able to think about how this enables these communities to plan and take action right now. Okay, Robert, we've already learned that uh, you might be uh, able to <coughs> invest into ships. Would you be able to invest into Arctic connectivity? <laughs> so one of the projects that, that I volunteered to, to lend some time to earlier this year was uh, in Alaska we have microgrid expertise that is nowhere else found in the world. Uh, so I helped to start up. Uh, get together with one of the most wealthy families in Alaska and put together their their plan for commercializing uh, microgrid uh, technology so that it's not just for the Arctic it this would be very useful in Africa and other places too as well as help remove diesel uh, from uh, the the calculus of how we power our local communities uh, however there's one problem if you don't have the expertise in the local community, and some of these communities are very small, you don't have people to sign off on certain things that you have to have be stamped in order to do. And so, thank goodness for Quintilian, thank goodness for GCI, one of the sponsors here, uh, thank goodness for the connectivity that is coming because without it, we wouldn't be able to successfully move forward with the funding for that small entity. And no, I have no financial interest in companies named 60 Hertz, by the way. You should be watching for it. Um, but the long story short there is, is that they are uh, at the forefront. They will help deploy throughout the high latitudes as well as probably move internationally. But it would not be possible because one of the check and balances in that system and that business plan is to have remote sign-offs. People walk up, take a picture of the, the meters or, or whatever else needs, needs to be monitored, and it's remotely s signed off. That's literally impossible right now in most of our communities. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we'll turn over to the audience and uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, so uh, please uh, be brief with the questions. Uh, so with that, uh, we allow as many as possible to participate into this and uh, Introduce yourself and uh, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, if you would like to address the question to uh, certain panelists. So we'll start with Paul, please. So do we have a mic, please? This is fascinating. Um, President Grimson mentioned this is sort of like a hallelujah conference. This is, I've heard things here I haven't heard in other meetings. Um, so this is different in that sense. Um, I'd like to go to the comments you were talking about investment and the notions that have brought, brought up in terms of future and intergenerational. Two types of investment, equity and debt. In the, in the debt investment, the long-term investment that would be many decades into the future, stable return on investment, how is this discussion moving in terms of engaging sovereign wealth funds and institutions um, to be participating in the development. Sorry, can everybody hear? No, okay, can you try to speak up a bit or is the mic? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I uh, was. Better? Better? So the, the observation was that uh, long term debt investment in contrast to short term equity investment. The question relates to the involvement of sovereign wealth funds and institutions in helping to transform what is considered a trillion dollars of investment over the next couple decades into sustainability across the 21st century. So the question is how do we engage the international community to invest in the sustainability of the Arctic to take the, the investment that's anticipated over the next couple decades and to transform it into sustainability across the 21st century. Okay, well thank you. And that was Paul Bergman from Tufts. Uh, Robert. So, it, it, very, very interesting uh, thoughts there. Um, because of the emergence of these entities over the last 18 months, it, that actually can become a reality because it's not a return on investment that was on most people's minds before now. It was a return of investment, literally. <laughs> can you lose your entire investment and get nothing back? And that has frequently happened in various jurisdictions, um, including Alaska for that matter. And so 
with this knitting together that we have of these these emerging entities that can bring us together uh, multinationally as well as within nations for that matter too that that is is facilitating a a pathway um, for the blood to get moving the financing to get moving and so for uh, just to borrow from yesterday's example than the one earlier I used because I want one on each side of the planet so uh, AIIB Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and then the Canadian Infrastructure Fund um, they basically are acting as those conduits. Um, they are debt heavy. The equity still has to come from somewhere else. But now, as I mentioned before, with the concern of return of investment being minimized in many of these jurisdictions, we can start talking about return on investment. I don't think there's a trillion dollars of investable opportunity right now. That will come over time. Um, that was, that's several years out. Simply, the logistics aren't in place. Shipping has to come online. We heard yesterday that uh, very rapidly 65% of the container traffic could move uh, through the oceans above. The Chinese have been extremely uh, proactive about doing that. They warned us three and a half years ago that they were going to do it. And last fall, lo and behold, they announced that they had qualified 12 different ship types. People seem not to take it very seriously until that announcement. So the point is, is things are starting to happen very, very quickly. There's a lot of investment opportunity, and there probably should be a lot of appetite with these new entities that have emerged. Roger Mock? Yeah, you know, I, I think at the heart of your question also um, raises points about risk and how do we cover risk. And I would say from a community perspective, what we're hearing from communities on the front lines are questions around what is, is termed in uh, climate change deliberations as loss and damage. So loss refers to those elements of infrastructure. No, damage refers to those elements of infrastructure, a bridge that may be damaged and could be repaired. Um, loss refers to those elements of communities, heritage, a burial ground that may be lost due to climate change impacts that cannot be, um, be rebuilt. So the question um, from a financial mechanism point of view is, is how do you cover communities loss and damage and this is globally this is a, a really important sticking point that came up in the climate change negotiations and the united states pushed against this because it raises questions of liability um, the insurance and reinsurance industry then have been looking at these issues and say, well, how do we work with communities to help them think of um, how they can cover their, their risks? And particularly if you're dealing with communities that are risk adverse. So we have been looking at some of the innovative financing, financial tools and mechanisms to cover loss and damage above and beyond um, the insurance and reinsurance industry. And that involves looking at some global risk pools that we've seen in Europe, in Africa, in the Caribbean that have been successful and have had some, some, some opportunities, but also um, looking at, at, at uh, what it means in terms of sovereign risk and how that helps communities deal with risk also. So it's an emerging field, but I think there's a lot of, of salience for those discussions in the context of, of the Arctic right now. So I think it's a, a really important question. Thank you. And Robert? Uh, so just to, to tail off of what you're just mentioning, uh, Roger, uh, there is there are some also some fairly new financial tools out there. There's some non-recourse lending that is now available, and it's because of the presence of these new entities that that non-recourse funding will be uh, uh, able to be actually ex extended. And so these risk pools that you're referencing, it, this is very real. Large-scale projects can happen now, but it, but the, it it is the pooling of risks with some other. Uh, 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 and I won't get into the granularity here, but some, some complicated financial maneuvering, but is only enabled with the emergence of these new entities. It shouldn't be lost on anyone what uh, President Grimson uh, took the time to share with everyone yesterday. That's very important. That is the only way, for example, gigantic projects like in the Laptev, uh, there's just huge uh, new oil discovery a few days ago that was announced. Gigantic projects like that wouldn't otherwise uh, be funded multinationally without these, these conduits. Okay, gentleman in the fifth row, please. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, question for Ms. Wollstone. Um, with regards to- Could you introduce yourself, please? Oh, yes, Steve Keating from Georgetown Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. Thank you. Um, I worked on cable ships up in the polar areas uh, 30 plus years ago, and it's really exciting to see these uh, new cable lines being uh, installed. Um, did Quintilian do new surveys for these cable routes? And considering how little um, new charting is done, is Quintilian considering sharing that data with the hydrographic services of Canada and, and Alaska so that um, updated charts could be uh, constructed? Hi, Steve. Thank you. Great question. So the answers are yes. The um, Quintilian's project, we spent about two years doing geotechnical and geophysical surveying and mapping, understanding the exact topography and the makeup in, of the seafloor in which we are trenching was very important to us because we needed to select the correct tools. Um, burying the cable along the route is important because of the many different risks that um, occur, including ice scouring, um, making sure that we achieve the desired burial depth, which goes below any historical ice scouring. So one of the things that we learned is we could see all of the historical um, ice gouging. So when the ice breaks up in the spring, it's a little bit like a mixing bowl, particularly off of Okiavik and um, Aluktok Point in Prudhoe Bay and breaks up and pushes on each other and, and gouges the seafloor. So we could see all of the historical gouging. We just couldn't tell if it was 10,000 years old or 10 years old. That required some additional um, research, which wouldn't necessarily add to the um, design of the, the build. So we designed the installation to go deeper than anything we saw. And so that's, that's what the desire barrier plan is for our system. Um, when it comes to the information that we have gained, and, and you're correct, these um, particular areas have not been mapped or surveyed um, in many cases. And we have turned over that research, the metadata, and, um, to NOAA, and they're compiling that. Um, we are in the, the next phases of the system. Phase two, as I mentioned, is in development. Um, those all require mapping and surveying as well. And so um, certainly we we see an international collaboration opportunity. Of course, we have to balance that with a proprietary, um, you know, pieces of being a company that's doing this for the first time. Thanks. OK, thank you much. And uh, lady in the second row, please. Hi, my name is Jessica Shadian. Um, I'm from the CIC and the Bill Graham Center at University of Toronto. And perhaps my question, I don't know, goes to, to Robert. And I'm, I'm wondering if you know, because you're talking about these different kinds of schemes, if you an know anything about the um, International Finance Corporation. And they have this new. It's called a Managed Co-Lending Portfolio Program, and it's for emerging markets. Can you uh, please put the mic yeah. quite close? It's for emerging, right sorry, yeah. emerging, emerging markets and developing markets, and the whole point is to focus on infrastructure development and kind of the exact things we're talking about in the Arctic. And from what I'm seeing from this, it's really focused on states, and so emerging, emerging economies in, in the context of the state. And I'm wondering if there's, if you know anything about this particular program, and if it's possible to kind of see the the art like looking at a regional perspective and so even though we have you know most of the arctic states are not emerging economies but the northern parts of those economies are very much similar to emerging economies and if there's any um i don't know possibility for the for arctic um to think transnationally and to be able to tap into something along these lines so yes and no uh the difficulty with uh opportunities such as that is if you're part of a mature uh, super national, national government, you're not going to gain access, as I understand, to those programs. However, the good news is, so I'm involved with the front end stru financial structuring of four different new international airports um, in the high latitudes. Uh, there are other programs that are available, and there's very unique programs available as well. And so while it's great to, to see other folks come alongside, I really think that the, from the debt side of things, which is where I primarily operate, uh, that there is plenty of capital available now. We just need to focus it properly. Okay. Gentleman on the fifth row, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Joe Demento, Professor of Law at UC Irvine, and I'm just going to add to the complexity of the environment of investment by underscoring some new under, um, understandings of liability within the context of domestic and international law that uh, are being informed in part by 
uh, the increased scientific ability to identify sources of, uh, of, of uh, greenhouse gases and direct them uh, to specific impacts and damages. So uh, it's another part of the complexity of knowing when and where to invest. We're going to be exploring this at our next uh, Arctic program in October at the university. Okay, thank you. I think it was um, more a comment than a question. Any of the panelists no specific views? Okay, we'll move on. Please, gentlemen on the fifth row. Uh, good morning. Thank, thank you for your, the opportunity to be here. My name is Michael Castellini. I'm the vice president for the University of the Arctic for Academic Programs. And uh, the last two days have been fascinating, as, as Paul Berkman mentioned. There's lots of things you never have heard before. It's been great. But one of the things is a huge demand for the interconnection, the education components, and the ability for the universities in the Arctic to be able to talk to each other, to talk to the, the southern parts of the world, and to be able to move students back and forth, move education programs back and forth. We are also not major investors. Most of the time, of course, we're trying to you know, scrounge money as we can to keep ourselves going. So we don't have the ability, the universities, to invest, as we've been talking about here in this type of infrastructure, but a massive demand for it. And so my question is, looking at it from all of your perspectives, is the role that the universities can do in both directions, either in helping you achieve your goals, uh, either through uh, discussions like just heard from UC Irvine here, or the other direction, helping us achieve our goals, because we're usually trying to do this on a, on a shoestring budget. And I don't know how to work in the area of uh, economic investment from university's perspective, because we have the demand, but not necessarily the ability to invest heavily, nor uh, the ability to um, uh, create, in many of the cases, the businesses, although there are business centers, obviously, at universities around the north. So I, I don't know how to actually uh, present the question except from the perspective of we have a huge demand, how can we help or how can you help us? Okay, let's take brief comments from each of the panelists since it's a broad and complicated question. But perhaps uh, we would move towards public-private partnership thinking in, yeah. in, in your problem. So start with Robert and go yep. along. Robert. So right now we have a program that we've launched in uh, subnational Canadian government. Pardon me for not giving many names here. That's I'm a neurosearch NDAs. Um, so we have a public-private partnership with a Canadian subnational um, that it's very – uh, productive for everybody. It ties together research. It ties together adventure tourism at the mid and high level. We do, we're not looking at the low end of the cruise ships. It's mid and high level. And then in addition to that, traditional knowledge. When you knit all those together and that existed already out of place, uh, there are services that mid and high level adventure tourism, tourists are willing to pay for. And that actually is creating a cash flow for the research organizations that are there. So imagine, if you will, those few dollars that are allocated to you, not only does it get you there, it actually creates a new revenue stream for you. And that's what we've been able to put together over the last eight months. Roger Mark? Um, I, I'll just say quickly, so I serve on an advisory board for the National Science Foundation, and we're specifically looking at how we can bridge the gap between social science and natural science. Um, and we're doing this in the context of looking at how we build resilient communities. And in doing that, we very often talk about the importance of citizen science, engaging universities, bridging uh, across silos, and what it means for basic research. And the Arctic is really a, a, a key component of the discussions and deliberations. So I would say um, look to what's happening and what's coming out, out, out of the National Science Foundation. Um, we continue to push for research across disciplines, um, and the Arctic comes up all the time when we meet. Christina? Great question, and I'll approach it um, a little differently than Robert as a developer of infrastructure and you as a user group are important to those of us developing the infrastructure. You represent large potential in terms of users on our network or others' networks and, and in communities, and that's part of the market analysis and, and where do we consider building and, and what's a um, 
what what are communities that have the potential to really use the broadband and to grow that grow that use um, the diversity of the usership is important and I, the the research community is significant um, bark the bark barrow arctic research center um, is a significant player in the arctic in terms of research facilities and there's great demand for increased connectivity and capacity in those communities with institutions such as BARC, with the schools, the uh, Ilisavik, the, the local college, um, the University of Alaska, facilities that do research are contributing to the opportunities to us to develop these systems. For example, the University of Alaska system has a research facility that's looking at Arctic installations of infrastructure, and that applies to telecommunications as well. And so I think from a um, participatory standpoint as an investor, I think there are other ways that the um, educational system is making investments that make it possible for companies like Quintillion to invest. Press. Okay, on the, the like what Christine said, uh, we got the Elitabi College, and I, then they go out and apply for grants to get what they want, and then they, I don't know how they uh, divide it out to the different villages to improve their uh, learning pockets, and then uh, the Bear Arctic Science Foundation, like what Christine said, fall into the National Science Foundation, and then they uh, apply for grants and stuff like that, and then they uh, continue to work up there and hopefully do more research and get more things done up there. So. Okay, thank you. Um, the final question, yes, uh, the lady in the back row, please. Hi, um, Allison Azar. I work for the U.S. Maritime Administration. I have a question for Christina and, and possibly also Price, if you want to weigh in on it. For um, your development of the of the fiber optic cable and then also the operation and maintenance that comes with that going forward, how are you managing those operations and what kind of agreements um, do you have with the local communities for conflict avoidance? How are you working with them and, and how are you going to move forward with that in the future? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, as Alaskans, it's important to us to have a healthy and vibrant conversation and to rely on local knowledge first and foremost in the communities in which we are developing. And also we have, um, it's taken us years to achieve the permits and the agreements and the rights of ways and the approvals in order for us to move forward with construction and installation, over 275 of them. And so it's been an active process. And since we are the first company to be deploying subsea cable off the coast of um, the Arctic United States and Alaska specifically, it comes with the unique opportunity of being the first. And so that has been um, that has been another um, not necessarily challenge, but it's been the re it's the reality of working in the Arctic and and working with the co-management groups, um, the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission, um, the Barrow Whaling uh, Whaling Captains Association, Kowarik out of Nome, um, the local co-management groups, and we participate with um, an incidental harassment authorization. I, I mentioned earlier our vessels are currently on their way to Alaska. Under our incidental harassment authorization, we have two. Um, public, uh, excuse me, protected species observers on the vessels in order to um, maintain an appropriate distance from uh, migratory mammals. And we coordinate on a daily basis with the whaling captains and the communities about where our vessels are and what they're doing. They move they move very slowly. It's basically a half a knot, and in many cases, the vessels are stationary, and so there's not a tremendous amount of movement or activity, And but we do coordinate quite closely with them. Um, and then in terms of the operations and maintenance, and from a fiber standpoint, the initial investment for construction and installation is, is more upfront, but the long-term um, 
the long-term benefit is that the operation, operations and maintenance should be quite minimal. We have dual redundancy of our equipment in each of the cable landing communities, and that's I can speak for Alaska because we've already installed those. Um, the design going forward is yet to be determined, um, but we have local uh, operations and maintenance agreements with the local telecommunications providers. For example, Aztec, which is the Arctic Slope Telephone Association Cooperative based out of Ukiavik and in uh, Point Hope and Wainwright, and then we OTZ out of Kotzebue and Tel Alaska out of Nome. And so it's been an active participation with each of these communities and their local providers in order to train and to prepare everyone for um, for the um, welcoming of fiber. And I will say one of the neat things that has happened, um, Aztec in particular, has deployed fiber to every home and building in the communities of Point Hope and Wainwright. And I believe that they're working in Ukiavik to advance that as well. Um, so an, an incredible amount of local participation and partnership um, as fiber is ready, is, is installed and is scheduled to be in service December 1st into those coastal northwestern and um, northern and northwestern Alaska communities. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Before allowing the panel to give their final one or two minute elevator speech, uh, I would like to tell you an Arctic elevator speech. <laughs> and this happened in St. Petersburg two or three months ago when we uh, were uh, visiting with the AEC Governance Committee, the Arctic and the Antarctic Research Institute of Russia. And the team went to the elevator and we were supposed to go from the second floor to the ninth floor. And the button for the ninth floor was pushed and the elevator started to go downwards. <laughs> so um, we had sort of interesting times and it went down and stopped like this and the doors didn't open. So here was the Arctic Economic Council Governance Committee with the director of the Arctic and the Antarctic Research Institute in the elevator. So what happened was that we were immediately given a presentation on the Arctic and the Antarctic <laughs> Research <laughs> Institutes. That's the best elevator speech I've ever had. And this happened in St. Petersburg. <laughs> yes. So the final remarks uh, in terms of what we've discussed and in terms of uh, the Arctic Investment Protocol. So the Arctic Economic Council is in a process of uh, adapting the Arctic Investment Protocol where there are six uh, important overarching themes. And this is provided by the World Economic Forum. The first one is to build resilient societies through economic development. The second one is to respect and include local communities and indigenous peoples. Third one is pursue measures to protect the environment of the Arctic. Fourth one is to practice responsible and transparent business methods. Fifth one, consult and integrate science and traditional ecological knowledge. And finally, strengthen Pan-Arctic collaboration and sharing of best practices, which I think that this all has been about. So the final uh, concluding remarks with each of the panelists start with Price, please. Okay, for the economic development, uh, we seek to improve the well-being of our quality of life for our community by creating or retaining jobs and support the growth of our uh, income and then hopefully we'll get our people to get some jobs so they could, uh, we need jobs in the North Slope because the uh, all the big infrastructure that we have up there are completed and uh, with the oil field coming on, hopefully with the, we'll be improving the community on the North Slope from Barrow to uh, Newark to Koktovik and to Wainwright and Atkatuk. So we're hoping that what we, what we hear is what's going to happen. So. Thank you. Christina. Thank you. Well, as my husband would say, I need a tall building for my elevator speech because I have a lot of words and I've used a lot of them already today. But uh, Well, in St. Petersburg, it was 10 minutes and then the doors opened. Praying for an elevator failure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> temporary. The, uh, as I began my talk today, it's, it's around this dynamic Arctic environment and the opportunities and taking advantage of them and timing. And 
in Alu recently, there were a number of presentations around additional telecommunications projects that are in the planning stages, not yet in construction or development phases. But there is an opportunity in the northeast, the northwest passages, the lower northwest passage where Quintilian is planning to lay its cable. And the opportunity to be active nations in the advancement and the planning of this is important. And it is, um, I think, encouraging that the focus of the events this week around Russia-Arctic collaboration and and from an Arctic collaboration standpoint, um, the United States has, I think, an opportunity and would be well positioning itself to be more engaged and more active in um, the Arctic role and what that means from a national security standpoint, from a development standpoint, from a research standpoint. So I think there's um, a great deal of opportunity, and we're thrilled to be part of the conversation. Thank you. Roger Mock? Thank you. I'd say three quick points. Uh, first, I think throughout our discussion today, we've talked about the opportunity to learn from traditional practices, um, from communities, to learn how we can cooperate with indigenous groups, and to think about what this means for win-win economic development that helps build networks of resilience that float all boats. So there's a really unique moment in time right now, and I think the framing that you have articulated corresponds quite well to that. The second point is the one that I raised uh, around eco-economics, to understand the short and long-term economic value of supporting ecological and cultural landscapes and to understand interactions with the local communities so we avoid these kind of back draft um, uh, environmental conflicts that, that we see can potentially emerge. So how can we do that? And finally, this framing that's important, um, the importance of recognizing how do we look at the day-to-day -day lives of these communities. What we are hearing from communities in terms of relocation plans is important, but ultimately that is tied to community livelihoods and well-being. So how do we take that into account as we move forward with long-term, resilient um, economic development for these communities? Thank you. Robert. Well, the polar giants have been joined by a new one, one that's been practicing for the last 10 years in the Antarctic. It's been lost on some. China has emerged. They have expertise in all sorts of things. Uh, someone asked a bit ago about uh, having access to, to uh, subsea data and those sorts of things. Uh, China has named over uh, 200 sites in Antarctica. They've been practicing and honing their skills for mapping and those sorts of things. So they're a serious contender both in terms of capital as well as experience, and it's gone unnoticed by many. But they're a welcome uh, 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 new polar giant uh, that, that has, has come to join us. Um, However, as I mentioned before, we have challenges with this, this uh, emerging economy, mature bureaucracy conundrum. And so if there's any involvement at all that I can recommend, it's that with local stakeholders, such as some at this table, such as some that spoke yesterday. Without that local stakeholder involvement and engagement, it'll be very difficult to overcome things. Another problem that we have in the high latitudes is that the projects that are moving forward, a lot of them are pet projects, and that is a problem. We need to go and look at the projects that are naturally moving forward, the ones that are ready, the ones that people are asking to, to, to fund. It's great to have new ideas out there. It, it, it's great to, to address some of those things, but there's a siloing that has also happened because of this disconnect, this conundrum I mentioned. And so it's through uh, concentrated efforts in, in uh, looking at what is possible now, maybe not a trillion, but there are projects right now that are, are, should be funded and have good returns. Uh, it's doing that hand in hand with the local stakeholders is how we advance. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining us. Uh, thanks to the audience, and let's give a big hand to the Wilson Center and to the panel. Thank you. And we'll go for a coffee break and reconvene by 10.40, 10.40 sharp, please. Thank you.